Let's demystify a lot of the concepts around these patterns, including what's actually going on behind the scenes that you might not be aware of. Let's go. We start with a simple vector of strings and each pattern we'll cover is going to reference it. This is a choreographed video, by the way. The code is going to do all the dancing, not me, and that is a good thing. First, let's convert this vector to a hash set. This is a really simple use case that is very, very common, but there is a lot going on beneath the scenes that you might not know about. In the Rust standard library, there are three important traits that make this pattern possible. Into iterator, iterator, and from iterator. First, let's talk about this into iter method we're calling here. Don't worry too much about the details, but into iter is a method of the into iterator trait, which is implemented by pretty much all collections, including our vector here. All implementations of into iter must return a concrete type which implements the iterator trait. There's some details here that I'm skirting over, but that's kind of what it boils down to. Biggest thing to note about into iter is that it consumes the original collection such that you can't use it anymore. There is another method iter implemented by many collections that does not consume the original collection. It typically gives you an iterator of shared references to the elements of that original collection. So if you were to use that here, you'd wind up with a hash set of string shared references. Iter is actually not defined by the into iterator trait though, so it's not really standardized in terms of what it does. Okay, back to the three traits we mentioned. The iterator trait defines all these handy combinator methods that we know and love. Filter, map, flat map, and so on. It also defines the collect method that we use in this example to convert our iterator to a hash set. If we look at collect, the return value must implement the third trait we're going to talk about, which is from iterator. Most collections implement from iterator, including hash set here. And from iterator is pretty simple. It has one method from iter, which returns the implementing type. Again, this is the method that collect calls. So walking through this simple example, we start with a vector called stuff. Vec implements into iterator, which allows us to call into iter, giving us a concrete implementation of the iterator trait. The iterator trait gives us the ability to call collect, and collect requires that the receiver, hash set in this case, implements the from iterator trait. This is why if you're assigning the result of a collect to a variable, you typically need to be explicit about its type because it's the receiver that dictates what the collect method is actually going to do. Okay, we know vector implements into iterator, hash set implements from iterator, but what is the concrete type implementing the iterator trait? Well, in this case, it's defined in the vector module and it's a struct called into iter. The naming might be a little confusing because it implements iterator, not into iterator. It might help to think of it more like vector iterator. Typically, you're not going to be interacting directly with vec into iter, but you can if you want to. I can assign a variable like this. Then we call dot next a couple of times and after that, we can call collect get the rest of the values and print those. Not ultra common to assign an iterator to a variable, but you can if you like. Now we have a foundation for how collections and iterators interact with each other. Let's look at some more patterns because there are a lot of goodies here. We'll start with kind of a mundane one, but it's worth mentioning. The good old for each loop. If you've ever used a for each loop like this, know that whatever you're iterating over must implement the into iterator trait. There is an implicit call to inter iter that happens on the thing that comes after the in keyword. That does mean that the collection is going to be consumed and you won't be able to use it afterward. As in most other languages, there is also a combinator called for each, and in Rust, it is a method defined by the iterator trait. The for each function has one parameter, which in turn is a closure with one parameter. It works pretty much like a for each loop where you want to just perform something on each element of the iterator. There can be some good reasons to use this instead of the for each loop, but yeah, outside the scope of this video. Now, what if we want to convert the stuff vector into a vector that contains the colors of each item? To do that, we can use the map combinator. This pattern exists in pretty much every programming language these days, so I'm really going to focus on the aspects of it that are specific to Rust. But if you've never used map before, the basic idea is that each element in the iterator yields one element of output, but you get to add some logic to compute that output element. In the closure we pass to dot map, we have this match clause that returns a color based on the item that was passed in. And then we do a collect, which converts the iterator into the new item colors vector. Okay, now onto the Rust specific stuff. If we look at the definition of the map function in the iterator trait, we can see that it returns this map struct. You can see the struct just stores an iterator and the closure that you pass it. And map does implement the iterator trait, so that's how you can add on more combinator methods after map if you'd like to. But this is really cool, check this out. Right now, if we come across a string that doesn't have a corresponding arm in this match block, we just yield this unknown string. 
maybe instead of winding up with an unknown, we want to make this an error scenario instead. There are actually two approaches we can take when errors are encountered. The first approach is to just store all the results in our new vector. When an error occurs, the error will just be stored as one of the elements in the vector and iteration will continue such that all elements of the stuff vector are processed. The second approach is kind of the fail fast approach. Maybe we wanna stop iteration and fail the entire operation immediately when an error happens. Check this out, this is really cool. Remember that it is the receiver that gets to decide how collect builds the type from the iterator. The way we have it now, the vector type handles the operation, so it's just going to iterate over the items and add them all to the newly created vector. Well, result has an implementation of from iterator, so we can actually just change the type of the receiver from a vector of results to a result where the OK variant holds a vector of strings. Now the result type gets to dictate how the iterator is converted into this result through its implementation of the from iterator trait. With this approach, when the closure returns an error variant, the iteration stops and item color's result gets assigned that error variant. In this case, because the first element of the stuff vector is socks, the error will happen on the first element. So only one element total is going to be processed. This pattern is used everywhere in the Rust ecosystem. So it's nice to be acquainted with it and understand how it works. Okay, I'll admit there are some pretty useless things in this vector. So what if we wanna prune out all the colon socks, leaving only the valuable stuff? For that, we have filter, which works pretty much the same way it does in other mainstream languages. Not too much to talk about in terms of Rust specific nuances here, but the filter combinator takes a function that defines what's called a predicate, which is a condition for including a given element in the resulting iterator. If the closure returns true, the element winds up in the resulting vector. False, and the element is left out of the resulting vector. So for the predicate, if we do item not equals socks and not equals coal, we can see we wind up with a vector that doesn't have any socks or coal in it. Nice. Then there is the any combinator. It's similar to filter in that it accepts a closure that returns a Boolean. But the end result is a Boolean value that indicates whether the predicate is true for at least one of the elements in the iterator. The all combinator is similar, but only results in true if the predicate is true for all elements. Okay, now here's a combinator that is somewhat unique to Rust. We've talked about filter and we've talked about map. You can chain them together like this, but there is another combinator called filter map that allows your closure to return an option. If the value is sum, it is included in the resulting vector. If it is none, it is not included in the resulting vector. That's pretty nice if the logic for filtering out elements and for mapping is intertwined. That way you can have it all in the same closure. Filter map is kind of similar to flat map and flat map is more common in other languages. Flat map gives you even more freedom in that your closure can yield any number of output elements for each input element. So now the return value of our closure is going to be an entire vector. More specifically, it can be anything that implements the into iterator trait. In this example, we're pulling apart pairs of socks. Whenever we encounter a socks in the plural sense, we yield two individual sock elements. For everything else, we just pass it through unchanged. That is flat map. Now let's talk about maps in the data structure sense, not the transformation sense. Say we want to create a map where we have a treasure key that maps to a list of all the gems and precious metals and another key junk that maps to a list of all the junk items. Hashmap does have an insert method that takes a key and a value, and that looks like this. But the second call to insert on the treasure key is not going to append the ruby onto the existing emerald. It's going to completely replace the first emerald that was already stored under treasure. That poses a problem if we're iterating over the stuff vector and blindly just calling insert for each element. Hashmap has what's called an entry API, and the entry method allows you to specify a key to operate on, and then the or insert with method allows you to associate a default value for that key if it doesn't already exist in the hash map. From there, you can tack on arbitrary operations to the type of the value. In our case, that's a vector, so we can call push, which we can use to add whatever element we have. So how does this help us convert our stuff vector into a hash map? Well, let's look at another combinator, which is fold. If you've used a functional language like Haskell, you've probably encountered fold before. If not, you might not have seen it. If you've heard of reduce, it's kind of like that, but with a little more flexibility. The first parameter is for an accumulator that's going to be collecting all of our values. In our case, that's going to be a hash map. The second parameter is a closure that has two parameters. The first is the accumulator that we can modify, and the second is the current item being iterated over. We can use the entry API pattern that we just saw to insert things into the hash map that we have as an accumulator. So we wind up with this nice declarative piece of code that clearly conveys our intent, 
we're converting a vector to a hash map. And in our closure, we have this logic, which inserts the specified key if it doesn't already exist, setting the value to be an empty vector, and then appends the current item to that vector. I hope this deep dive has given you a better understanding of Rust collections and iterators, including how some of the most common patterns work under the hood. Now, I love using Rust for working with large language models. And I think a deep understanding of large language models is one of the best things you can add to your skill set this day and age. I actually made an entire video showing how to build a full stack chatbot in Rust using open source language models. I'll give you a link to that video in a minute, but I also want to recommend the course How LLMs Work by the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. I'm currently working my way through the course, and so far it has really helped me understand how language models work behind the scenes. I thought I knew language models, I did not know language models. Brilliant distinguishes itself by putting an emphasis on learning by doing. If language models aren't your thing, they have thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Skills that can really help give you an edge in this industry. One of the really nice things about Brilliant is that it makes mobile devices a first-class citizen, so you can jump back into your favorite courses when you're on the go instead of you know mindlessly scrolling tech Twitter or something. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, Visit brilliant.org slash code to the moon or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on a link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I hope this video has helped you better understand Rust collections and iterators. If you are interested in building with language models or you just wanna see the breadth of what's possible with Rust, definitely check out this video I mentioned where I walk you step-by-step -step through building a full stack chatbot in Rust. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.